It's my pleasure as director of the Arts Research Center of the Faculty of the Critical Theory Designated Emphasis of the, and as a member of the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs at UC Berkeley to welcome all of you today for this year's final events in all three of these projects, centers, consortiums. Before introducing our guests, I would like to acknowledge the financial support from the Arts Research Center, Critical Theory, the International Consortium for Critical Theory Programs through a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as well as from the University of California Humanities Research Fellowship that have made today's lectures and tomorrow's mini-seminars possible. I would also like to thank very specially Brianna George, Laurie McPhee, Lauren Pearson, and Diana Ruiz for the incredible work uh, that they have done with all the details of this event. It, it has been, and I say this as the, you know, in the closing remarks for the year, um, it has been a deep honor to be able to work alongside each one of you throughout this entire year. Nothing could happen, neither at the Arts Research Center nor at the Consortium for, for Critical Theory Programs without each one of you. So everyone please join me first in giving these four radical women a big round of applause. academic programs for the projects that link the endeavors of these three units that I named. The task of decolonizing critical thought, of opening the Anglophone and Eurocentric tradition of critical theory to an engagement with intellectual traditions from Latin America and Africa, of fostering from my vantage point as a Latin Americanist, South-South conversations, particularly between Latin America and Africa, and it's asking through an understanding of the work of critical thinking as an art itself, how different disciplines of humanities alert us to the intimate publics that are formed and deformed in times of loss and crisis, of how feminist, queer, decolonial perspectives and interventions call attention to and reclaim the political implications of critique as an art form and of art itself as critique beyond Eurocentric ramifications of critical discourse, and what kind of unbelongings, interruptions, and displacement figured through tropes of gender, sexualized, ethnicized, and racialized vulnerability could allow us to think with the limits, the resistant, and the creative potential of critical thought. I'm particularly interested today, and this is why I invited Yala Kisukidi and Rocio Sambrana eh, to join us for this closing event, in their work as scholars of philosophy, eh, perhaps as philosophers, although I have read a couple articles where Yala um, said that she's not sure she defined herself as a philosopher, but more as a historian of philosophy. So we'll get to talk about that later, I think. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the move by both uh, Yara Kisukidi and Rocio Sambrana eh, as scholars of philosophy to spaces, discourses, subjectivities that have not belonged to the realm of the so-called field of philosophy as understood in its most classical definition. Yara Kisukidi published her first book on Henri Bergson, and Rocio Zambrano published her first book on Hegel. Now, for their current books in progress, once established and sanctioned as excellent universal thinkers, and I'm obviously being a little bit exaggerated here, flattening out the more complex academic production of each one of them, but you get my point. Um, so after being sanctioned as the, you know, you know, specialists in the universal realm of philosophy, they have both shifted their attention away from the classical library of philosophy per se, to expand it towards politics, histories, territories, subjectivities, and forms of thought from and in the South. Yara Kisukidi has been working on African thought, on the question of what are the stakes and risks of claiming an African philosophy, and she'll be presenting on that today, while Rocio Zambrana has been working on debt and coloniality in Puerto Rico, not a typical topic for philosophy. So today's presentations speak from different grounds, address different geographies, yet both emerge from a deep engagement with the aftermath of colonialism. 
proposing ways for decolonizing thought, for decolonizing universals, for decolonizing philosophy itself. It's interesting that their respective titles for today, Philosophizing in a Dominated Land, which is Yana Kisukini's title, or, or it was, yeah, I'm not sure it still is, um, and Pasarse Politicamente, which is Rocio Sambrana's title, would work as titles for the other's presentation, as you will see once you hear them. That is, can the seemingly forever abject, indebted subject of Puerto Rico philosophize? Is not proposing a form of thought that is both universal and grounded in specific geopolitics and histories, not a way of pasarse politicamente, that is, crossing the line, overreaching, going beyond the limit of the possibilities of philosophy. Furthermore, there can be no decolonial project that is not at the same time, I strongly believe, a feminist project that understands decoloniality and present-day feminism as necessarily intersectional. Undoing the logic of colonial modernity with its discursive practices of philosophy being a, one of, of, of the you know, important discursive apparatuses of it, and its categorical systems of oppression must place women of color at the center. So here we are. Please join me in welcoming Yara Kisukili and Rosia Sandra. Those were really rich and wonderful introductory comments that I will be thinking about as I read and engage everyone. It's really um, lovely to be here this afternoon, and thank you all for being here um, and to be in conversation again with Yala and, and Natalia and, and others. When we speak of the right to protest, I don't know the rights, we are not speaking of the possibility of reconciliation. There can be no doubt. The gap is insurmountable, and precisely our fight demands that we denounce it and open it even further. The justice system is colonial, patriarchal, slow, and punishing. The fight against La Junta, the Fiscal Control Board, uh, is anti colonial, feminist, agile, liberatory. End quote. In Puerto Rico, acts of subversive resistance not only denounce the gap between law, state, capital, and a population that must assume austerity, foreclosures, school closures, tax incentives for creditors and vultures, promesa, and so on. They open the gap even further. Protest involves discomfort, incomodidad. To protest is to dislocate, dislocar. Acts of subversive resistance open the gap even further since they require that a violence that is ubiquitous be perceived, indeed become intelligible. In Ultima Llamada, Guillermo de Ollohil examines variations of protests that dislocate, that create discomfort. They are all forms of what he calls pasarse politicamente, political crossing the line, going beyond the limit, overreaching. Pasarse politicamente is to, quote, overturn the limits of political action, to transcend the register of acts and expressions customary and, as, and easily accepted by society at large as reasonable forms of protest, to the point of bordering on the ridiculous, or the dangerous, or the undesirable, in some, in all that is difficult to accept, even within the opposition itself, end quote. Teodoro Hill seeks to call attention to the assumption in Puerto Rico that political dispute, irrespective of gravity, gravity or urgency, should never turn offensive or violent, unfriendly or rude. Pasarse politicamente then is an interruption of the violence of quotidian life, he says, that offends. The point is that it should offend because, quote, the objective violence to which it points is extremely offensive. Pasarse politicamente has the potential to interrupt the bounds of intelligibility by indexing the violence of quotidian life. It is a precarious form of protest, however, given the discomfort that it generates. It is precarious not only because it indexes the race, gender, class hierarchy on display when acts are deemed unruly, 
vulgar, violent. It is precarious because, by and large, it fails to appear as an act of protest at all. Theodor Hill calls his precarious acts hopeful, nevertheless. They are hopeful because they require the very transformation of sense or network of agreements, it's entramado de entendidos, to be grasped as forms of protestation in the first place. So today, I want to examine Theodor Hill's conception of pasarse politicamente as a form of interruption. Because Herbert Hill focuses on the precarious nature of the act itself and emphasizes that it is precisely its uncertainty that makes it hopeful, I propose reading his conception in light of Walter Benjamin's notion of an emsetsu, a deposition or an interruption. I suggest recovering Benjaminian interruption articulated in the critique of violence via the discussion of shul, death, death or blame, in capitalism as religion. After a sketch of these concepts, I examined Jorge Hill's account of the 2010-2011 student strike at the University of Puerto Rico and the lessons it carries for forms of protest beyond the university. I'll also consider the 2017 strike and the first manifestation in response to the relief efforts in the context of Hurricane Maria, led by the Colectiva Feminista en Construcción. The economic, political, social, and environmental catastrophes that Puerto Rico is currently facing presses us to articulate practices of critique and resistance that move from an economic to a historical understanding of debt. Critique and resistance entail reckoning with historical debts that not only produce financial debts and their impact, but that are debts consummated in financial debt. They entail reckoning with the logic of capture, predation, and extraction of a debt economy and the race gender hierarchies that such logic expresses. Such reckoning seeks to reverse the purported powerlessness of the indebted through practices that subvert repayment, resisting moving too quickly to gestures of forgiveness, reconciliation, or restitution. Practices are subversive when they distinguish between a logic of collection and a logic of reckoning, between debts to capital and historical debts, between a refusal to pay and assuming historical responsibility. They seize the power to bind that instituted historical debts consummated in financial debts in the first place. To move from an economic to a historical understanding of debt that makes available subversive resistance requires at once tracking the history of debt while dismantling understanding history as debt. Benjamin's critique of guilt history is helpful for specifying the strictures of resistance in this context. Guilt history is a conception of historical causality tied to the generative sequence by which guilt is incurred. Such sequence binds the debtor to the fate of capital. Key here is the possibility of interrupting any such sequence, any such fate. In Capitalism as Religion, Benjamin recalls that Weber argued that capitalism is a religiously conditioned construction. Benjamin, in contrast, maintains that capitalism is itself a religious phenomenon. First, capitalism is a pure religious cult, he says, one without theology or dogma. It, it, um, its religious structure is expressed in the immediacy of meaning. Second, the structure of capitalism expresses a permanent duration, he says. The, the time of capital follows the strictures of exploitation. It binds subjects and populations to the extraction of value. Third, capitalism is the first case of blaming rather than repenting, he says. Rather than offering or requiring atonement, capitalism engenders blame. Guilt binds subjects and populations by being a form of subjectivation. Guilt indexes a debt, debt indexes guilt. The guilt debt nexus permits no action, no freedom, no liberation, he says. Fourth, the climax of guilt is a conviction of God himself is guilty. Capitalism is not the origin of guilt, but guilty. Guilt turns against itself. Rather than atonement and restitution, capitalism destroys material relations, forms of sociality, modes of subjectivity. What is historically unprecedented about capitalism is that religion is no longer the reform of being, but its obliteration, Benjamin writes. This logic of ruination sets strictures for its interruption, as Werner, Werner Hamaker points out. Interruption can either be from within, as reformation, or from, with, nor, uh, from without, as renunciation. 
Reformation fails to accomplish atonement since, what, since it can only be represented as the dynamic progression of death in capitalism. Renunciation fails to accomplish atonement since it cannot avoid having the cult as its cause and speaking the language of the cult. Hamaker argues that the formula of this double exclusion contains a hint. The possibility of liberation from guilt can only be located at the very extreme of guilt, he says, where it no longer is itself, yet it is nothing other than itself. The climax is nothing but the exposure of dead credit god capital to itself. The logic of ruination has the capacity to destroy the guilt nexus itself. I read this as it carries interrupt interruption of the immediacy of meaning, the modus of perturbation, and the logic of ruination distinctive of the guilt dead nexus. In the critique of violence, Benjamin examines the violence at the heart of positing, setsu, and articulates the critical power of a deposition, and setsu. The violence of positing is a matter of institution and conservation of the law. Positing accounts for what Benjamin calls the mythic violence of the law. It initiates logic of boundary, grense, that binds institution and conservation. Such binding institutes a mythic order that admits no future. But such an order is of, a t of tightly knit material relations that express the logic of annihilation distinctive of capital. An end set so interrupts this logic of the boundary and its order. The challenge here is to think of pure mediacy beyond a set so. The effectivity of n setsun does not reorganize material conditions within institution con conservation, rather it unbinds the organization or disorganization of material conditions under capitalism by resisting the nexus itself. Lacking an end amenable to institution conservation, it subverts mediation itself. All law is an institution, an effect of an appositing, a setsun. Positing institutes an order, but it also seeks to preserve such an order. The violence of the law is rooted in this, invest, in, in, in this investment in its own conservation. Violence is fundamentally lawmaking, as we know, uh, he argues. It institutes the law, hence mere less stable relations. It does not mediate, but rather posits such an order. Lawmaking is non-mediate, as Rudolf Gachet argues. It does not have its essence in being a means to an end. Law preserving violence, in contrast, seeks to conserve ends tied to the instituted order. Benjamin characterizes such an order as imposed by fate. The mythic character of the law concerns the way relations are bound within the sphere of fate. Said so initiates a boundary between law and what it is not. Such a boundary is a form of binding, I would suggest. It binds the initially non-mediated violence of lawmaking to the mediated violence of law serving. The purported purity of lawmaking is not maintained as it posits, binds it to the ends of law preserving violence. <coughs> Hamaker reads Benjamin's conception of an insetsum as affirmation. He reads Benjamin's essay as developing a politics of pure mediacy. The purity of pure mediacy can be understood in terms of the means and relation. Politics is pure when it does not serve ends situated outside of the sphere of mediacy. Means are pure when they do not follow the order of positive norms. A politics of pure mediacy is thus that which never preserves nor mandates a certain way of life. It, in fact, interrupts it. Crucial here is not the purity of politics, I want to suggest, but that it is a pure mediacy. Hamaker argues that mediacy is the field of affirmation. Affirmation is the condition for any instrumental performative violence at the, and at the same time, the condition which suspends their fulfillment in principle. As such, affirmations are a condition for something to happen in the sense that, in a quote, first they let this thing enter into the realm of positings from which they themselves are excluded, and second, they are not what shows up in the realm of positing so that the field of phenomenality can only indicate the effects of the affirmative as ellipses, pauses, interruptions, displacements, etc., but can never contain or include them, end quote. As affirmation and setsung is not a negation, it does not take cue from the logic of faith that it interrupts, that it interrupts. Yet it is not an exit from the strictures of material historical reality. It is located within the mythic order. 
However, in its quality of being unmediated, it cannot appear within it. There is no certainty where, uh, when pure violence was actual in any given case, as Benjamin writes. So, as, uh, Benjamin's examples, his discussion of the proletarian strike is most relevant here. Following Sorel, he distinguishes between the political general strike and the general proletarian strike. The political strike causes only an external modification of labor conditions, he says. It merely inverts relations of domination. It preserves state violence and the legal order tied to it. Hence, he says it is violent. The general proletarian strike, in contrast, is pure means. It takes place, Benjamin writes, in the de determination to assume only a wholly transformed work. The proletarian strike is nonviolent, he says. It interrupts the violence of capital as well as the complicity of law and the state with that violence. Crucial here is the distinction between a mere modification of working conditions and wholly transformed work. While the political strike accepts the terms set by the ends of capitalism, the, pro the proletarian general strike questions the very structure articulated by those ends. It discloses capitalism as the locus of violence. The proletarian strike is not a negation of the term set by capital. It interrupts by exceeding its demands, by going beyond the institution. This, ex this excess discloses the institution's complicity and domination. The demands are concrete, although they are not goal-directed. They seek to dismantle structures of domination without offering an image of state of affairs to be put in its place. The general proletarian strike subverts mediation itself then, by turning a form of protest aimed at negotiation, the strike, against the possibility of meeting any ends within the bounds of the institution itself. And setsum is an interruption without certainty. It occurs only within the sphere of immediacy, but it cannot appear within it. It interrupts the violence necessary to the sphere of fate, but it, its effectivity might not be apparent or even realized. Holy transform work remains to come. Now, while Benjamin calls a proletarian strike nonviolent, it is a figure of divine violence, he says. And he writes, it is justifiable to call this violence too annihilating, but only uh, but it is so only relatively with regards to goods, right, life, and such like, never absolutely with regard to the soul of the living. This distinction that Benjamin makes here does not secure an and setsum, or its meaning, however, the proletarian strike obstructs the activity of binding that articulates the complicity of law, state, capital, but it cannot secure normative stability for itself. Its nonviolence may appear as violence. Its investment in the soul of the living might appear as an attack on it. The 2010-2011 student strike at the University of Puerto Rico responded to, then, to the then Governor Luis Fortuño's austerity plan. In 2009, Fortuño declared a state of fiscal emergency. 26,000 government workers were laid off, bargaining rights, social protections for public employees were suspended, privatization was intensified, substantive budget cuts to the university were announced. The strike occurred in two phases. From April to June 2010, students shut down the University of Puerto Rico campuses. From December 2010 to March 2011, the police besieged the UPR campus in Rio Piedras, breaking the university's non-confrontation policy. Artistic demonstrations, forms of political horizontalism, and the creation of an autonomous media characterized the first phase. Alliances with the environmental and LGBTQ and pro-independence movements were consolidated. The strike had the public support. The second phase responded to the government's attempt to undermine the UPR's internal governance and bargaining agreements with students. The two-day strike was planned for December 7th through 8th, but security guards removed gates at the UPR campus to prevent student shutdown. Court state of police actions against students were varied, but they included restriction of entry and exit for food delivery, criminalization and prosecution of student strikers, legal and discursive strategies that presented students as consumers rather than workers, thereby delegitimizing striking as an appropriate mode of political opposition. Students shut down the, cam the campus through smoke bombs and rocks, wore hoods and, and masks. 
The strike was criticized by the public and deemed a failure. Although the figure fluctuated, the Fiscal Control Board announced in April 2017 that the UPR system would suffer a $450 million budget cut, which would entail closing campuses and programs, a tuition hike, and the elimination of tuition waivers. Cerrar para abrir, to close in order to open, was one of the main slogans of the 2017 strike. Shutting down operations aimed to create time and space for reflection on the debt crisis and, and its impact on public education. From its inception, the demands exceeded the institution that, strike, that the strike paralyzed. In addition to resisting austerity and the neoliberalization of the university, the furthering of that, the strike was articulated around the demand to audit the debt, contest debt repayment, oppose the precarization of public education in general. It drew from the horizontalism of the 2010 strike, but protested the non-democratic governance non structure imposed by the U.S. Congress, La Junta. Its claims addressed not only the UPR or Puerto Rico's government, but the Fiscal Control Board itself. While many saw the strike as the first bastion of resistance of the, to the imposition of La Junta and its austerity measures, Others saw it as a failure that culminated in costly property damages to the university and symbolic damages to the resistance. If a strike is already an awkward mode of resistance for students who are not workers, critics argued, striking to resist the fiscal control board was simply a category mistake. In addition to organizing symposia on neoliberalism, debt, urbanism, and democracy <coughs> debates, the students organized activities that address issues relevant to the LGBT community, especially the trans community. They also interrupted a meeting of the UPR Board of Trustees, forcing them to sign this document that purported to establish support for a debt audit and the rejection of budget cuts. The students were accused of vandalizing campuses. Despite the mixed reception, the Physical Control Board granted the student, the, the movement, a meeting. Reuelo Hill discusses the 2010-2011 strike under the heading Fracasos, Failures. Collective memory, he says, distinguishes between the strike's two phases not according to shutdowns. Rather, people remember each phase according to the tactics the students employed. Above all, he says, those used in confrontations with agents of public order. People recall, recall the first phase of the strike, the creative strike, in terms of artistic interventions and the affectionate contact between the striking student body and the various sectors of society. It was successful, rational understanding that moved a country that seemed to be asleep. The creative strike offered a new image of the student strikers, historically seen as unruly, as innovators of horizontal forms of political organization. Cordiality and courtesy were thereby reified as the only appropriate means of contestation. Mm -hmm. The second phase, in contrast, was deemed a failure precisely because of its scenes of, he says, violence, discontent, frustration, lack of control. Smoke bombs, damaged property, covered faces, solely the newly cleansed image of the student protester losing the general public support. As Marisol Lebron, and Giovanni Roberto highlight, the second phase was also deemed violent through race, gender, class markers, especially race. Confrontations with young black men from Loisa and Carolina, predominantly black uh, poor towns, hired and deployed to subdue the students, uh, fed an image of violence, disorder, lack of control. The tactic students employed, it was argued in some comprised sorry, compromise the very project of resistance that had gained traction during the first phase of the strike. Teoya Hill questions the view that the second strike was a failure. The second phase was deemed a failure because the students, he says, crossed the line, they overreacted, acted poorly, incurred in practices contrary to the interests of the groups and the ideals that they were supposed to represent, end quote. He contrasts the second phase of the strike not to the first, but to Occupy Puerto Rico. Among other things, he reflects on instances in which Occupy collaborated with authorities in planning and executing protests. Occupy was not a political force in the archipelago, although they were seen as unruly. Their unruliness was tied to trash left at the campsite. The student striker, in contrast, renounced cooperation with authorities, responding to, yet thereby amplifying, 
the violence of capital law, and the state within and beyond the institution. That overdoing, that violent excess, Hiroyuki writes, offensive, wrong, alarming, within the context of protest makes possible a clear, dynamic, and risky image of opposition, which in turn serves as a starting point for critical reflection and to make adjustments to our methods and manners on the way. Whoa. The second strike was thus, then, he says, an inspiring failure. In a chapter entitled Agua Fiestas, Killjoys, and of course he's thinking of Ahmed here, Teodio Gil examines modes of political opposition in Puerto Rico that defy, he says, traditional scenes, either because the claims are not easily comprehended by the public or they are enacted by subjects that are not recognized as political actors. He begins the chapter by arguing that the protest is anything that has that a protest is anything that has hope. Following Bernard Thorpe, he argues that because subjects who, the subject to protest cannot control the meaning of her act, because it is a matter of the public's uptake, there is a, he says, deficit of meaning when they follow a script that is well known by the public. Even if, even if a protest disturbs the flow of quotidian life, it is not hopeful if, if it does not interrupt the bounds of sense of the community. Protests are only hopeful, he writes, when their claims result incomprehensible, thus, and this is the point, impossible to address without transforming the framework of sense in a community. The repetition of forms of protest without major disturbance throughout time, he adds, can even be proof of the stability of the prevailing order. He goes as far as saying that traditional protests in Puerto Rico have ceased to be insofar as they lack hope. For Heoyahil, interruption requires grasping acts of protestation, especially, he says, especially when what the subject of protest, of protest does seems extreme or unpleasant or capricious, and is, it is done in an inadequate place, in an inadequate time, which could be understood as too much stupidity or irresponsibility on the part of the agent to be cataloged as a clear manifestation of political opposition, end quote. The precarious nature of such acts, to be sure, is due to the precarious nature of racialized and gender individuals protesting, especially black and brown men and women living in poverty, for example. However, they are precarious because they defy the bounds of sense, yet they thereby have the capacity to break such bounds. They potentially interrupt their logic and its order. These acts amplify the violence to which they are responding, but they thereby have the potential to contest it. They contest ubiquitous forms of oppression from within. They do so without an aim. Precisely because they amplify the conditions to which they respond, they cannot secure their own appearance or normative stability. Teodjahi discusses three precarious acts of protest. Consider the following two. First, a 2013 tweet perceived as a threat to then Governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla. The tweet vented frustration about withheld tax refunds. The author of the tweet was incarcerated for six months. The tweet was not intended as a, as a mode of political opposition. No political group defended its author. Yet the incarceration of this individual should make us pause, here which it suggests. The tweet should be read in light of a systemic invisibilization, he says, and disappearance of a sector, young, male, predominantly black and poor, quote. The subject that speaks is a subject traversed by race, gender, class, and as a result, marked as a subject of violence. The point is that the subject is allowed to appear as a subject of violence if he does not articulate such violence as the, he says, direct result of a social system. The question that we must ask, then, the question that might turn venting on Twitter into an act of political opposition, perhaps even a, a hopeful act, is as follows, he says. Uh, is as follows, and I quote. Exactly how should we expect these young people to articulate their claims if not through the discursive codes that they manage in their quotidian life in all its classes? To demand a different discursive register is to insist on their invisibility. Seen as such, of course the tweet should offend, because the objective violence to which it points is extremely offensive, end quote. The man's vent on was turned into an act of violence, violence itself individualized. He indexed himself as suspicious, dangerous, and violent in indexing the violence of indebted life in the colony. Consider second an, 
the exit interview of a woman who attended the Tradicional Fiesta de los Días de Reyes in January 2013. In this event, low-income children collect Christmas gifts. The, the children um, are asked to draw something in return that specific year. The woman was asked to reflect on her day and the present her daughter received. She seemed unhappy with the event, in particular with the gift, un trapo de bola, a lousy ball. In the media and within social media, the woman was said to be ungrateful, he quotes, uh, ungrateful and a bad mother, guilty of imparting the wrong values to her daughter. Peor Hill reminds us that the Fiesta de los Días de Reyes is part of what is seen as a culture of the mantengo, the welfare. With it, the government attempts to instill the value of work and responsibility, not only gifting it educational presence, but also turning the gift into payment for something accomplished, the drawing in this case. Peor Hill writes, El trapo de bola, the lousy ball, became the metaphor for a loose life, una cotidianidad agarita, a life lived poorly in thousands of homes throughout the island. That is to say, the critique of the woman launched against the event was redirected, transformed into an allegation of culpability. It was not a lousy ball, but a lousy mother with a lousy life, offering her child a lousy upbringing, and who does, and just who does that lousy woman think she is to complain? In this way, her expression became the principal reason for not recognizing at all her right to speech, end quote. The woman's complaint was turned into her guilt, poverty individualized. She indexed herself as guilty in indexing the guilt of a political economy that induces poverty. In both cases, Theodor Hill argues, the subjects are killjoys, agua fiestas. Se pasan. They cross the line from the get-go. They are an uncivilized excess, he says. They can be read only as dead weight. They are scapegoats. As protesters, they inhabit the most vulnerable of positions. They are not students or workers, readable as productive members of society. They do not redeem productivity. They are failed neoliberal and colonial subjects. Their protest is incomprehensible, hence they are punished or silenced. But these are protests perhaps in the most proper sense, he argues. They are hopeful. They interrupt everyday life because, he says, they kill the joy of our ideolo ideological fiesta. They protest despite obstacles and from the least adequate space without organizations or committees or signs. Nevertheless, they are protesting. In, the most cases, in most of these cases, however, the protests did not appear as such. The offensive violence that put on display is turned against them. They appear not as figures of, viol of hope, but as figures of violence. They index systemic violence, yet they index themselves as violent. We might say that these acts of protest are figures of Benjaminian and Setsun. They are the condition for the disclosure of violence, hence for something else to happen, and for violence itself. They have the power to destroy, but they can be folded into the logic of preservation, further binding these individuals uh, to the fate of capital. Consider a third example, and I'm closing quite soon. A week and a half after Hurricane Maria, La Colectiva Feminista en Construcción, intersectional uh, feminist collective, um, protested in front of the convention center in San Juan, headquarters for the intergovernmental recovery effort. They denounced inefficient rescue efforts, the militarization of those efforts, and the growing humanitarian crisis. They argued that this, that this catastrophe is not natural, and that's, that was the main slogan. They denounced poverty, environmental racism, and the increased discourse favoring privatization in this context. Maria laid bare not only the erosion of any democratic control of an unincorporated territory managed by a fiscal control board and in that, at that moment the U.S. military. It further clarified inequalities that run along race gender lines already made evident by the debt crisis. Response within social media was unrelenting. These women were deemed ridiculous, privileged, lazy, obstructive, inappropriate. They called for political reflection when people were struggling to find water, food, gas. For La Colectiva, that was the moment for political articulation. That was the moment to grasp the catastrophe as political rather than natural. To conclude, protests that cross the line, que se pasan, interrupt the materiality of guilt that nexus. They have the capacity to interrupt the forms of binding that reproduce colonial debts by generating new modalities of capture. 
They interrupt the materiality of the guilt that nexus by subverting repayment, protesting the ways in which subjects of violence appear as culpable. They might fail, but they protest. They might not come to fruition in a wholly modified life, but they have the capacity to interrupt the guilt that nexus here and now. He is the Negro, 
an animal, or a man. He is some part of the life of the mind at stake in Africa, a continent often described as devoid of text and writing, populated of a ferocious beast. Beneath the issue of the appropriation of philosophy as a term, and that of its, possi of, and that of its possible deterritorializations, <coughs> a whole material history of violence unfurls. This is what I wish to explore here with you all. I wish to focus on the histories of violence concealed under the issue of the reappropriation and deterritorialization of the term philosophy outside of Europe. How the name, how the noun philosophy could become an embodiment of violence and of material violence. To do so, I shall start with a question, kind of easy question. What does it mean to philosophize for one whose humanity has been denied? First moment. Uh, when a child will read, we have to read over again. In 1997, the writer Patrick Chamoiseau published the essay, Writing in a Dominated Land, in French, it is Écrire en Pays Dominé. And the book opened open, with the following words. I have the quotation in French, but I tried the translation with the French accent. So. <laughs> so you have it in French, but I will read it in English. How do you write when your imagination soaks up from morning to dreams, images, thoughts, and values that are not your own? How do you write when what you are vegetates outside of the forces which determine your life? How do you write when you are dominated? What do the literatures have planned for you? What have they sedimented, sedimented sorry, over time for you who suffocate under this colonial modernity? The words of Patrick Chamoiseau are rooted in the place, Martinique, the West French West Indies. So the Martinique country. To write from this place is to describe a situation of utterance already bound within a politics of violence. When Christopher Columbus landed on its, on its shores in 1502, present-day Martinique was inhabited by Caribbean Indians were gradually wiped out. A French territory from the 17th century onward, it became a land of slavery with the implementation of the plantation system and the connection of the Code Noir, the Black Rule, the Black Code. After the, the so-called abolition of slavery, 1848, Martinique received the status of, the, of a French colony. With the 1946 departmentalization, it became a French department. So Martinique country is permitted by a long history of deportation, colonization, and assimilation. Three types of politics telling a continuous tale of dispossession. The power of dispossession is to build subjects who remain strangers to themselves. The conditions within which their lives develop on the psychical, existential, and material levels remain fragile. So to quote Jadid Butler and Athena to Athanasiu, I will just define dispossession as the following. Dispossession describes a kind of normative and normatizing violence which determines the conditions that make life livable. So in Chamazo essay, the Caribbean subject exemplifies the dispossessed subject. He inhibits an insular space forever reminding him of his foreignness to the world. The island bears the trace of an Africa characterized, characterized sorry, by an impossible return for having become foreign to the subject. The island is organized and structured by an external and remote frame of reference, that of France, its monarchies, its empires, its republics in Europe, 7,000 kilometers away. 
And the dominated land is a territory where the disposed live together. Those whom the violences of history have left out of the parsing out of the lands and the seas, depriving them of shelter and rest. So Chagosso's question is then the following. With which words, which language, which frame of reference can one arrive from within the Caribbean reality? In a dominated land, the writer is a poor scribe with a distorted mind. His writing is nothing but imitation, a repetition of codes of dominant imaginations now internalized and which he cannot come to consider his own. Let's quote Chamozo again. I suspected that all domination, the silent form all the more, is born and develops from within who we are. Insidiously, it neutralizes the most intimate expressions of dominated peoples. I should then question my writing, chart its dynamics, suspect the circumstances of its arising, and sound out the influence exerted upon it by a domination no longer seen. But how? The writing we have to move towards other relations, explore other encourages, other circulations. Okay. In a very different geographical context, yet rooted in a similar situation of utterance marked by the violence of colonial dispossession, the Kenyan writer Ngugi Wachiongo encourages writers from dominated lands to reclaim the injunction to move to the center. In a collection of texts moving the center, The Struggle for Cultural Freedom, published in 1993, Ngugi Wachiongo revisits the political and cultural meaning of the injunction towards dissentery as it emerged in the 60s. What means dissentery to, to Ngugi? Dissentery, on the historical political level, refers to the effectiveness of the struggles which led to the vast process of decolonization, transforming and shattering the colonial world map after World War II. On a cultural level, certain level so, dissentering refers to the right of formerly colonized people to define themselves and their relationship to the universe from their own location. The aim is to not only to reclaim a vernacular language as opposed to colonial languages, but to reconfigure and create a language, language, lexicon, grammar, code, to reclaim the right to name the world for ourselves. This is decentral. But we've been talking about literature. I just would love to ask a question. Does this process of decentering, of writing from the dominated land, uh, play out in an identical fashion for literature and philosophy? Throughout the history of Western philosophy, especially in the 18th and 19th century, when philosophy, as you know, in Europe became, uh, academic, became an academic discipline, the question of the relationship between philosophy and its territory has been fetishized. Philosophy's territory, elevated to the dignity of a philosophy, has been sacralized. The identification of philosophy to the West is essential. It was the very possibility of dissentery or at the very least narrowly restricts its conditions. <coughs> Decentering philosophy, as is a Western practice, could only go one way. It does not mean claiming the right to do things by yourself, but legitimizing <coughs> by repeating on some other territory than the West the history of a genesis and affiliation. It started in Greece and continued in Europe. Now it can also continue in your country. And this is exactly what Deleuze and Guattari in this marvelous book are just saying. So under the veil of irony, the cunning of cynicism shows itself. Dissentery philosophy will only mean reciting far from the West 
what has already played out once of its land. Philosophizing in a dominate, dominated land or writing in a dominated land raise questions which do not overlap. The problems tied to literary writing and philosophical writing explore in different ways the issues of genesis and filiation, of legitimacy and justification, and henceforth of the belonging to a territory. He who philosophizes in a dominated lane remains dominated within philosophy. The practice of philosophy endlessly reminds him that he appropriates the codes of a tradition which he has had nor the initiative to create, nor the chance to develop, and which he contemplates the stranger to himself with envy. With envy. So how does one come to terms with defeat? Can one philosophize in a dominated land without being dominated in the history of philosophy? To enter a tradition that, it not, that did not invite you. To ask, to ask sorry for hospitality to an overly wealthy host who looks down on the deprived and presents himself on the threshold and lusts after his goods. This question is at stake in a crucial essay of the second half of the 20th century, Muntu in Crisis, written by the Cameroonian uh, philosopher, or was it thinker, Fabien Ibusiboulaga, and it was published in 1977. The dominated land here is not Bratini anymore, it is Central Africa, permeated by colonial history, and especially Cameroon in this case. Boulaga's book, La crise du Mutu, Mutu Crisis, that has been published uh, in English for three years ago or two years ago. So the question, uh, Bulaga's book opens with the following question. In French, in English now, what is both revealed and concealed by an African claim to possess philosophy? Bulaga shows how the African desire to appropriate the term philosophy is more revealing of the situation of the African subject, which he calls the Muntu, which means human in the Bantu language, the language of Central Africa. So he just shows the situation of the African subject, a kind of clinic, who lays claim to philosophy, then of the contents, issues, and objects of any philosophy that might properly be called African. So in order to better understand this reversal from the discipline to the subject, the shift from the issue of the possible African deterioration of the discipline to the issue of the subject practicing it, a few words must be said about this book, The Mutu Crisis. Just a few words. It is tempting first to associate Bulaga's work with the project of postcolonial writings in general. Mutu Crisis and later another book called Christianity Without Fetishes, calling to question the effects of colonization upon the culture, the societies, and the forms of knowledge in Africa. Beyond the apparent similarity of the projects and the subjective affirmations they claim, the claiming of speech by the South, only one year separates the Mutu Crisis from Said's Orientalism, 1978. The Palestinian writers' work launched the postcolonial studies movement. The Cameroonian philosopher work reached a more limited readership in African and Afro diasporic world throughout the 20th century and now the 21st. But this comparison between Said and Bulagam has a primarily heuristic value. It sheds light on the specificities of Bulaga's project setting him apart from the works which make up the post-colonial library. In his 1978 essay, Said defines Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. A sovereign West contemplates itself with glee in the knowledge it produces of others in order to dominate, it, to dominate them. Bulaga does not focus on the conquering writings of the colonial West or on the master narrative of modernity supporting them. He focuses on the forms of writing, literature, philosophy, 
theology, and on the practices, religion, resistance of those vanquished by colonization and who tried to speak again, once again, in their own name. What kind of discourse do they produce? So the classical expression of this project is coached in the Muntu crisis in the following terms, to be by and for oneself, by and in the articulation of having and doing according to an order that excludes violence and arbitrariness. So the object of Pulaga is defeat. Its subject is the vanquished, he whose historical genesis connects colonial temporalities to neo-colonial reconfigurations of power in 20th century Africa. Defeat describes the historical condition of those who have experienced failure, a setback altering their being and which cannot be repaired. It portrays the psychical and existential situation of the Muntu, whose frame of reference has collapsed during colonization and no longer constitute a transparent resource in his effort to rise against the violence of post-colonial Africa. Subjectively, the crisis of the Muntu, the crisis of the human, refers to the historical condition imposed upon African men and women. <coughs> Objectively, it points to a crisis of the humanities in Africa with which language, which grammar, which lexicon can one break free from defeat? How does one live and trace paths from, for the future despite the irreparable? The crisis calls for the charting of new utopian becoming. We must then come to understand how the many colonial narratives, forms of knowledge, beliefs, economies, have taken hold of the moon to rewiring his memory, pervading his language, and shaping his desires. We must analyze how the colonist world, imposed through violence, has become a familiar reference which has taken the place of the cause and imagination of the moon to one's, one's words. The vanquished is effectively, materially, and ontologically captured by the one who triumphs. The process of freeing oneself from this old can only be construed in a negative mode, far from the illusions of returning to some immaculate decolonial essence, according to science, or of a radical beginning which negates time and history. And this is how the project is really interesting, because from the perspective of the defeat, we are not just drowning in a kind of a theoretical melancholia. But this is how Bulaga tried to reshape the idea of utopia. And this is the question he asked. How does one come to terms with defeat? How does one come to terms with defeat? Not in order to perpetuate a violence against oneself, but to trace paths for the future. How can the other's language, the language of the colonial of the colonial system, become my language? So it raises the problem of utopia and not of melancholia. The utopian becoming is coached in the negative terms rather than heroic ones. It distances himself from certain narratives of cultural liberation present in African and Afro-diasporic worlds in the second half of the 20th century. For example, the coming together and giving and receiving, this horizon of the future which permeates the many voices of negritude, neutralizes social conflict at a time when dominations must be reflected upon. Or another example, coming from the US, the, and Africa, okay, it's, it's mixed. The African Renaissance, as expressed by Sheikh Montadio and its latter day re-readings by the Afrocentric movements, supports affirmations of identity, return to traditions, the notions of civilizational precedence, etc., repeating subordinations which must be deconstructed. In this narrative, for example, negritude, Afrocentricity, African Renaissance, the vanquished remain trapped. The dream of the vanquished, his dreams, his will to know, his new utopias, 
or bear the trace of his defeat. Meaning the West and remaining a stranger to oneself, being done with the West and nevertheless maintaining it as a norm and a reference. So the cycle goes on and on and on. It is akin to what Congolese intellectual Valentin Moudimbe termed in 1973 the rule of alienation. It's funny to read it in French, so I read it in French. Où ceci ou cela, si ceci ou vers cela, si cela, je cela, sans ceci. C'est-à-dire un cela diminué. Ou la sauvagerie ou la civilisation, si vous choisissez la première, l'impérialiste vous aura et vous perdrez tout. Et la seconde, vous perdrez votre culture. Which means, either this or that, if this, we lose that. If that, I have that without this. In other words, I diminish that. Either savagery or civilization, choose the first and imperialism will get you and you will lose everything. Choose the second and you lose your culture. That's the rule. So how can you build a utopian perspective when you are trapped with this rule? That's the question of Bulaga. So defeat always recalls the Muntu, the African man, woman, and the diaspora. So defeat always recalls the Muntu to his, to his own death, where self-affirmation and self-negation tragically go hand in hand. How can one free oneself from this cycle? How can one be free from the rule of alienation? How, in a situation of defeat, can one chart path for utopian writings and practices to open up the future? It is in this context of defeat that the African reappropriation of the signifier philosophy must be interpreted and understood. The desire for philosophy, the claim to extra-European philosophical territories, hides something which must be cleared up and which goes beyond the very signification of philosophy as a discipline and an intellectual practice. The vanquish, he whose humanity has been denied by colonization, in trying to reclaim philosophy's name, calls out for something beyond it. At the heart of the desire of reappropriation, philosophy appears as a mere mediation, if not a pretext, always gesturing towards something else than itself. I know why the cage bird sings. So let's go back to Blaga. And I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you, but I, will, I won't talk anymore about Utopia. <laughs> Just about philosophy. <laughs> I have no direction for the future, so <laughs> it was a, I'm sorry about that. So tell me, Muntu, why you want to philosophize, and I will tell you what ails you. When Bulaga wrote uh, Muntu in Crisis in the 60s, the issue of the African reappropriation of the German philosophy was playing out in a very precise context. The African deterritorialization of philosophy wavered between activism as a narrative of the return to oneself and imitation, a transparent copy of the West referential framework. On the one hand, in the second half of the 20th century, the debate around the existence or the absence of African philosophy took over the intellectual French-speaking African world. It explored the relevance of the notion of North philosophy, the idea of a philosophy rooted in the values, mores, languages, and ways of life of African people. To recognize the existence of ethnophilosophy is to recognize the existence of a properly African dimension of philosophy, a genesis and affiliation of philosophy owing nothing to its Greco-European history. <coughs> On the other hand, hand Mutu in crisis calls into question the forms of institutionalization of philosophy in schools or in the university on the African continent. Within the institution, the African philosophical library is completely European. This paradox is glossed over by the presumed ideal permitting it. As you all know, I don't know if it is what you learned when you started philosophy, but to, phil to philosophize, I would say, platoon is to die to oneself, which is great. And it's to die to the sensible world. Particularity, body, color, skin, gender, history, sexuality, 
accidentality do not determine philosophical activity. The philosopher has no flesh, no ground, no history. Repeating the languages of the European philosophical tradition in Africa is not devoid of any sense. The life of the mind is not conditioned by temporal and geographical coordinates. So perhaps the question of decolonizing philosophy is not a problem itself because we need for the mind and the mind is not rooted in the ground. So within those two expressions of the desire for philosophy, the moon too reveals himself. He reveals his flaws, his sufferings, his true aspirations. The desire for philosophy bears witness to a defeat and to the way the moon too navigates it. It points to a history made up of victors and vanquished. Not just any history, a colonial history, understood as the history of the Muntu's attempts and vicissitudes in resembling his master and being recognized by him. The desire for philosophy, coached in the debates surrounding ethnophilosophy or the Africanization of philosophy and its institutional forms on the continent, reveals nothing but the process of identification at stake between the Muntu and his former master. With this in mind, the philosophical beginning no longer has the classical meaning of a wanderer in the face of nature and thing. What comes first for the Muntu is a stupor caused by total defeat. So the desire to reclaim philosophy to Africanize philosophy, to repatriate it to a part of the continent where other traditions of intellectual life owing nothing to the West have flourished, is the consequence of stupor in the face of defeat. Stupor is a radical wonder which paralyzes. It leads to a state of torpor which crushes any chance of reacting accordingly. It is also a consideration, a shock, explaining that we no longer belong to ourselves. Ethnophilosophy, that is to say Africanization of philosophy. So ethnophilosophy or the formal reproduction of the canonical texts of Western philosophy in school or in the university are just a response to that stupor, underlining further the Muntu's strangeness to himself. The Muntu, in the face of philosophical tradition, sees himself as someone doomed to play catch up in order to reach a shimani, the masters, of which he is lacking. Philosophy hence appears as an attribute of power of which the vanquished is deprived. The mirror handed to him by philosophy shows the image of an incomplete being deprived of the attributes that would attest to his contribution to the excellence of humanity. Possessing philosophy will hence, to be, will hence be the undeniable evidence that it has now been able to become a part of it. So the issue of philosophy is to conclude the issues of philosophy's reappropriations and deterritorializations is not neutral from an axiological point of view, especially with regards to the political history of dominations and to colonial history. It shows that philosophy plays out not only in its own problems and contents, but also throughout the social and affective representations that the term embraces and brings forth. <coughs> For history's vanquished, who inhabit other lands than the West, claiming the term philosophy perhaps always points to something other than philosophy itself that philosophy cannot bring. The desire of philosophy has nothing to do with philosophy. It reveals a condition of violence, not an emancipatory hope, where the term philosophy functions just as a metonymy. As a metonymy, it means just humanity and civilization, nothing else. So the answer to the question, how to philosophize in a dominated land, is not linked to problems of epistemic justice. It is just a reenactment. How to escape from philosophy to change the world, even if it means remaining in a nameless space. Thank you. I think that um, there are a number of places of intersection in what at first appears to be very different, uh, both
methodologies and uh, languages and objects um, uh, questions, right? But the idea that um, how to speak in one's own name or to name the world for ourselves to, to uh, uh, quote Yana's uh, text and her large question um, is perhaps not so different from the, the main, I think, question that you ask, uh, Rocio, which is like how to be outside the law. You know, it's like this mode of interruption that you're calling for is a way of being a becoming untied of you know both lawmaking and law policing um, and law questioning, right? And so I think that I wonder if those two general formulations of what you are asking can speak to each other given the history of colonialism, because I think that that is where they're positive um, from. I think that it's very interesting how, even though you suspended the question of utopia, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh, okay, I'm going to leave it there, um, but you do actually come back at the end, um, and that even though you don't use the word utopia uh, at all um, in, in, in your presentation, Rocio, I do think that this, this way of pasarse politicamente, of interrupting by exceeding, and of not knowing what will come, but knowing that what has to come has to be entirely different. And that entirely different, and, and the idea that it, the, the failure of it, the fact that it does not have a shape yet, is linked to the question of utopia that Yana is um, asking. So that, that's kind of a second um, thing, point that I wondered if, if you would be interested in talking about to each other. And the last thing um, is, is in, in this, you know, in kind of decolonial in move that you are both uh, engaging with, it, it called out to me probably because I'm a, I'm a, even though I, everyone knows here, I barely do any literary criticism. I was trained as a literary critic. And so um, it's, it's the place that literature has for both of you, you know, um, in, in your choice of uh, figures through whom you will ask a series of questions, right? Um, I also know it, it, it came up in your talk and it, it comes up in your the readings for your seminar tomorrow. We'll see you the place that Deleuze has for both of you in the kind of place of anti-philosophy. Um, but but we, we, we can uh, uh, keep that one, or perhaps that I personally think they are related. This, the way in which she goes go both to the letters and to uh, <coughs> writers of uh, fiction or of poetry, right? Uh, of thinking of that discursive practice as a practice that does that never yet has a form. And that that is what you are both proposing in your own ways as what might lead us out of the violence, and the, and the systemic violence that seems to have no outside, right? Which we want to like perpetually bound to. Um, so, so violence doesn't come up as a as a as a practice for you. In, in, in the in the the recorrido, the, the how do you say recorrido? Recorrido in, in the in the in the, in the in, what? exposition. In the exposition, maybe thank you. Yeah, in the exposition that you uh, gave us, Yala, uh, as a as a strategy. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if violence, such as um, um, Rocio offered it to us, uh, uh, could serve the utopia of um, naming the world for us, for, for ourselves, right? And if that violence is also linked to literary practice, right? in, a, in a formative way, not in a negative way. So those, I know there's just a lot there, but you, you can pick one and go wherever you want or not, or we can look at the public. Those are just some of the things that I would I would like to hear you to talk about.
actually tracking the relationship between law, state, and capital, um, but as a way of kind of what is, what is the frame of intelligibility and the, the difficulties of it. Um, and so violence as, so the, the modes of, um, the ways in which violence is indexed by, by subjects that are located within it and are traversed by it. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of philosophy, I go outside of philosophy as the canon, although I know I did a lot of really classical philosophy with Benjamin here. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, I, what I, want, I actually think that the Guillermo Hoya Hain part and the, the whole Puerto Rico part is where the philosophy is actually doing mm -hmm. work insofar as it is naming something. Um, so, what is philosophy for you and what, you know? I was talking about the list. Mm -hmm. The list says that it was a question for the old people, mm -hmm. not in what is philosophy, but we can reclaim it. Uh, I think I know, but um, I, mean, I wouldn't say, the question is not to me what is philosophy. So it's a, philosoph it's a philosophical answer, that is to say, I won't answer to your question. But it is um, that what is interesting it has, it is how it transforms itself. And the questions that interest me is how a certain, when philosophy become a Western tradition. This is the question that interests me. I mean, and there is a date for that. It is the, eight, the 18th and 19th century when in the universities in, uh, in Europe, philosophy uh, was separated from theology and became a discipline in the universities, in the academies. And what is interesting is that when you have such debates like, is there an African philosophy, for example, this debate does not question the problem of philosophy itself as a practice, as a practice, sorry, but it interrogates the way these narratives of the specialization of philosophy in the West countries was exported through colonization, mm -hmm. through the missionaries and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so this is the question that is that interests me. Mm -hmm. Not really what is philosophy to me. I mean, and it's funny because, but I love, I love to play the margin sometimes. It can be quite annoying, but you know, the term philosophy is very sacred, supplies. There are great texts of Bell Hooks that I love about literature when she says, okay, I'm a black woman, etc., etc., and I'm reading some great authors, and I discover that they target me, that I am a target. I am stupid in those texts, I don't write, I'm nothing. And when you enter the tradition of philosophy, I mean, philosophy, when philosophy became a tradition, there is no, I, I can see horrible things about, okay, black people, even about Jewish people, etc., etc., and at, at a certain point, I just wonder, why do, why did I choose to do this, to read this? And the question of, is there an African philosophy, to me, is a very horrible and awkward question, because first it has to answer to the way philosophy has specialized itself at a certain time of history, 
and has specialized himself by racializing itself. Because at the 19th and the 18th century, we're not only talking about philosophy, but we're talking about also how philosophy was racialized and how to deal with philosophy became a racial issue, something for the white people in the West. And this is those kind of transformations and the kind of, um, and what I love also with philosophy, when, when we all have our heroic histories, and I know that my heroic histories in philosophy is that I started with Jean-Paul Sartre, and I was very, this was really the, the, the embodiment of what should be a philosopher, to fight for emancipation, mm -hmm. to, to struggle, to demonstrate, to write big books that nobody wants to read. Mm -hmm. This was this mix of everything, and at the end, when you enter the canon, you see nothing that has to do with the kind of uh, social images of philosophy you made. So this is how I would answer, how, I would answer how philosophy became a tradition, how philosophy can just bear so many paradoxical uh, aims or desires, how do we connect the reality of the practice with the social and affective representation of it. So to me, is that I am completely in this uh, mess with philosophy. And, and I would agree um, that the question of what is philosophy is a question of the institution of philosophy and the exercise of power that is the generation of a canon and um, the building of curriculum and um, just, so not just um, its historical formation and um, the ways in which it is a way of articulating uh, that it is not, that we cannot separate it from this exercise of racialization and, um, and its very real effects. Um, I had a question uh, for you. Just can you just repeat? You had a, such a, a development about who, mm -hmm. and could you uh, just um, repeat that? Because <laughs> I, sorry, no, no. I, I think I missed a point and just so yes. So yes. So I, I think that what what interesting kind of overlap in uh, or point of convergence or point of conversation between our papers had to do with failure um, and defeat. Um, and so I'm quoting Claire Wilhelm, who thinks that every every act of protestation is structurally harmful because it is actually aiming to call into question a practice or an experience or an institution or an whatever. Um, is they're being traversed by. Um, so, so to protest is actually to bet on something else um, structurally. But um, I actually don't work with the I don't work with the category of utopia. I work with pessimism in the book. And so, what would it mean to actually in respond, interrupt? Um, Precisely, it, the, the problem with the, it's, it's not, I don't want to glorify violence, so it's, it's not a call to violence, but rather a, um, that any, any, any intervention, because it indexes violence, it implicates itself, because it, 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 it reveals something about its structural conditions. So, so for me, that, that means, and I think that these are the discussions in Puerto Rico about, um, about pessimism. How, how does one act when there is a very, there is no horizon of possibility? Um, and so utopia or progress or optimism or, so all of these figures seem as depoliticizing because they posit something that, um, they posit conditions that are not imaginable. I understand. And abstractly. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you work with utopia in a very different way. Yeah, because I, I just put the term from, it's funny because um, I don't see it as a very modern, it's a, I mean, when I use the term utopia, I take it from Vlaga, but also from other writers. 
but they don't um, they don't um, understand it as a program, you know, or as something that is already planned and that has to be realized. Yeah. But it's more, and there is something that is important. I still think about Césaire when I speak, and also of Fabien um, Boussiboulaga. But Césaire as a as a as a as a, a word that is not utopia, but that is hope. And in French, we say espérance. Because I don't know, we have this difference uh, in French between espérance and espoir, hope and hope in English. Mm -hmm. And espérance is a theological word, and hope is just, uh, I mean, prosaic word. Okay. And hope just means the future, and espérance means, uh, as you know, in the, in the Christian uh, tradition, if you read, I mean, the, the, the principle of espérance and the way it was um, we read, we read by the. Protestant uh, theologian like perhaps Moltmann, or even you have that in liberation theology, mm -hmm. it just means to, to act in the here and now, mm -hmm. and to be able and and to keep the faith, just to stand in front of the the the, 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 the defeat when if there is no issue. Mm -hmm. So the category of utopia and hope here, or perhaps espérance as, as as I would call Césaire, is especially the kind of category that describes the fact that. There is no issue, but you still act. And this is exactly what it means. So that's why I, I wouldn't say these are heavy categories with you know, the idea of progress or the idea of the, the brighter future. With the, 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 we have this expression in French, I'm sure it's possible to translate it with the lendemain qui chante, the morning, the tomorrows that are singing. That's literally that. With the big revolution that is coming, because it's not coming usually, it never comes. Mm -hmm. And when we have to face this kind of defeat, where can we have the, the resources just to act? And this is the kind of questions that you find in Caesar's philosophy, in Caesar's writing, in Bulaga's writing, that can be sometimes very theological, but they are just um, questioning the, 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 the resources of the people when they have to face the, the idea, sorry, that there is no alternative. Because the only fact when you just act, it just means I'm acting for an alternative. So my act, protesting, this is why even protest with a lack of hope, just say this is not the world we are already living in. So this is the, the, this kind of concept that, I, that I'm interested in. And it's funny, I'm not writing a book about pessimism, but about hope. So. The perspective that you are again and going to the negativity. And from Bergson, because I have problems with dialectics and all those things. What? What happened to you? Of course, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. It was a caricature, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Should we um, open up to questions from the <coughs> audience? Um, yes. Uh, sure. Thank you both for your presentation. Your last answer is actually a good transition because I want to ask about both of you guys about um, immediacy because it seems like a, kind of the one of the terms that might cost both of your papers is that like in the acts of protests that are like kind of read poorly, I guess there's like an immediate action that takes place, like something that responds to it becomes like this kind of immediate space in which kind of like uh, the act is why it's being reinterpreted maybe badly. It's still being like seen kind of more immediately, and then in yours it's kind of like the philosophy can just be, the start of philosophy is just like picking an object or like, to like, hope, like what you're just saying, like hoping in the moment, or like living in those kind of moments and acting through it. And that maybe philosophy would just be to start on the African continent, just like, well, just pick an object and start talking like philosophy. So I was wondering if both of you could speak a little bit more to how, if immediacy plays as like a term when we think about things which are like, like, yeah, like there are differences, differences for both of you between things which would be like mediated and then like this kind of more immediate experience, maybe the positive. Um, protests in your paper, for example, would be like more immediate. Mm -hmm. if, it, if, it, if, if it's okay, we'll take a couple questions so that there's a couple questions on the table at least, maybe three or so, and then so that we keep some time for the Canada and the other Canada, so we'll go like that. Thank you for these um, really wonderful talks. Um, Rocio, I need to be persuaded that, well, I don't need to, but I would like to be persuaded that, and I'm going to put it very um, crudely, any interruption of the order of violence, um, regardless of how it's read, how it's responded to, uh, is, is 
uh, of political protest that we can affirm, even if it's not attached to a movement, and even if the interpretation or the reading or the rendering or the reaction to it um, is, um, I might say, mobilizing for the other side. And so I would like to maybe hear a little more about the lousy ball. Um, which is an, it's a really provocative story or instance. And um, you know, we have so many eruptions now, not necessarily tethered to a movement, but that are cries, we might say, against regimes. Uh, but then in their interpretation, their rendering, their transmission on social media, et cetera, et cetera, they, they actually seem to be pushing us sometimes down or backwards or um, splashing mud in our faces. So I, I think you must have something to say about why you are affirming any, any interruption um, as more than an interruption, but actually as having a political cause. So I have two questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for wonderful talks. One question is about um, the question of protest and you said that precarious acts or certain, uh, this is, I'm waiting. <laughs> precarious acts or certain practices fail to register or to be rendered as protests, right? That there's something about them that is, um, remains invisible as acts of political protest today. And this was, and your paper was inviting us into that sort of world of political practice so that to make it visible. And then, but it is, and, and it's the comparison to the meaning that I'm not convinced by, and I wish those acts themselves were able to offer me more visibility. I mean, I understand the, the need and the urgency of articulating certain practices as political protests precisely because they, they fail to appear as such. But for Benjamin, the, um, the general strike is already visible as, as, as protest, right? So that category is already available and is already visible. And the question is different than with the comparison with, uh, with the political strike. And here we have visibility that is different, actually visibility that might lead, invisibility that is different, one that might lead Wendy here to ask you the question she asked you, right? So is Benjamin that helpful for understanding those political, those processes and practices, to, those protests and practices today? Or is there something else that generates their invisibility? And I know that Benjamin is helpful also in relation to questions of interruption and the guilt and interruption of mythical violence and so on and so forth. I get that relevance, but I'm asking about the question of visibility and the articulation of these practices as political. Protests. Uh, that, that's my concern with you. And Lala, um, thank you. I mean, now I understand why you don't want to be a historian of philosophy, but an anthropologist of philosophy. <laughs> I get another point because um, um, so history would be another representational effort, and you you don't want to do another side and representation and effort. And I get and I and I truly appreciate the point about. So to, on the one hand, the, the decolonial move is to say let's, or that some of it is other kind of moves, to, to say let's expand philosophy, let's make it, let's look at different traditions and let's compare different parts of different philosophical traditions and so on and so forth. And I get that you're not going in that sort of expansionist or comparativist or progressive story of philosophy where we can finally recognize other traditions as properly philosophical and so on and so forth. And that's why you're an anthropologist, really not a historian of philosophy. Um, and, but, and so if that is the line of inquiry, and I think that's what you're getting at, but if it, what is at stake for you, an issue for you, is that question of the desire to philosophize, or that is really the question. What does this desire point to? Right? If that is the question, I actually wonder what does it point to other than the conditions of colonization and power relations? That is, 
is there something else beyond philosophy? And I can't really remember the sentence, your sentence, because I think it's that every time there is a desire for philosophy, there is something else that is, yeah, exactly. that is in, yeah. right, that is involved. And so something else, it's not something else that I'd like you to just unpack it for me, maybe I misunderstood. Is it only the conditions of colonization, the history of colonization, the power relations, and so on and so forth? Or is it, is it another form of knowledge as well that is non-philosophical? Or that is, we don't need to call it non-philosophical, but it's not something else. So that pointing to, what did you have in mind? Only the history of colonization or also a site of possibility? Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I would like to ask just a um, simple conceptual question. Um, so as a graduate student who has been trained in literature and as a literary critic, but who's also very interested in philosophy, I am curious about um, some like methodological uh, questions that you uh, and how you address them in your work. So I guess one as a as, as a literature scholar, one is asked to read to read literature and to read certain emergence of critical thought or um, critique in that literature, and then use a conceptual apparatus that comes from somewhere else to analyze the literature. But that in itself is not philosophy. Um, whereas on the other hand, if one wants to um, take the bracket the word philosophy and just use critique or even thought. What would be like those distinctions, and uh, what is philosophy uh, to you uh, in regards, like vis-à-vis -vis those uh, other terms for meaning, philosophizing activity, like uh, thought or critique? Are those terms opposing philosophy, or although we know they come from philosophy? And how do you read in the protest in literature? critical gestures <coughs> as philosophy, and, and is that philosophical activity just reading critique and tracing critique in various sites, or philosophy is something else, and then what is it? Um, desire of philosophy. First, philosophy is a metonym, so it just embodies the idea that when you pronounce the term philosophy, usually you don't say philosophy, you say humanity or civilization. And second, it has, I don't know how you say that, it's specular in, uh, in English, specular. Yeah. It, has a, yeah, it is a kind of specular term, that is to say when you pronounce the term philosophy, you just talk about the subject, it mirrors the subject the European subject. So um, the desire of philosophy is a desire to be like this European subject that was able to be to build a great civilization in this kind of uh, questions like is there an African philosophy. So the something else is of course can be at the end I, was, I wanted to be quite provocative in the conclusion so I said it has nothing to do with the question of epistemic justice of course, it has to do something with epistemic uh, injustice or not. And of course, you have to open, perhaps, new territories of knowledge. And this is why I just finished with the, 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 the quote, but we, even if it means to, uh, re, even if it means remaining in even nameless space. We don't know how we're going to name it. But what I love, really, in this kind of a reflection and through Blaga's writing is that the question of the desire of philosophy must be interpreted in a very materialistic way. That is to say that the people who are expressing this desire are just telling that their material condition of living are material condition of domination. So it's quite, I don't want to be the, 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 the very um, simplistic Marxist, but at the end what just says Bulaga is that through this desire of philosophy we just see the real uh, will to change, I mean, the material condition of living. And this is the something else that is interesting me. Because you can have a kind of a abstract discussions about liberation through language or things like that. Because, you know, as we know, you can have a very uh, authentic um, understanding of language by saying we're going to free ourselves by using African languages. 
but if these are dicta dictators that are just saying exactly the same things in Lingala, Yoruba, than in French, just dealing, you won't have anything as a people, I don't see where the liberation is. So I think the, the, what the question is, is that the liberation cannot only be a cultural, but it has to deal with a very material transformation <coughs> of society. And this is what uh, Bulaga and also something else that is at stake in the deconstruction of this, of this desire of philosophy. And this is this on something else that interests me. So, um, should I, can I? So, um, thank you so much for your questions, Samara and Andy. I'm just going to take them a little bit together, and because um, they're very, very important. Um, so, I don't. I, do, I think Hiroyo He does want to say something about the political value of non-political, most of not straightforward political actions. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to say that um, that that what I argued was an affirmation of any type of interruption or, or any type of protest that that seeks to interrupt. I'm interested in I'm interested in the the ways in which we index systemic violence or systemic violence is indexed and um, and how that um, how that has a political nature insofar as again it it it, it assumes or presupposes um, that um, betting on something else and not just an affirmation of those conditions that these subjects are being traversed. And I think, so something that the paper does but doesn't do in this version is that it moves from these acts that are individual, so the tweet and the in exit interview, they're individuals that, that disclose something about precarity and birth of people. Um, but the, the example of the colectiva is an example of a political organization that has actual traction as, as, a, as a very important political f feminist space um, that, um, that then also takes us from the kind of individual nature of these other examples to a collective. Um, a collective articulation of and, and an explicitly political articulation of the problem such that it generates um, um, modes of intervening with the state or with um, the operations of debt in the in, in, in the island and so on. So um, so I don't I don't want to say that those examples of the lousy ball and the tweet are political through and through in a in a very in a, in a narrow sense of the political that they are that they necessarily lead us to political organization. I don't think so. I think you're right to say, Lenny, that um, that there is a way in which they could be obviously co-opted and mobilized and and, and rather actually um, um, not. Uh, produce any any insight or any form of political mobilization, um, and I think this ties very importantly with your question, Sana, because um, so so what I'm interested in in the Hoyohe and and I think at some point I you know I should go back to whether Benjamin works here. That's a real open question for me, um, but it's the question of intelligibility and the routine. What happens to protest when it becomes a script, and, um, and then it actually becomes a way of expressing the status quo? And so, you know, yes, it's a bother that I can't get to work on time because there are these people like blocking the highway, um, you know, taking, you know, on that with signs and what have you. Um, but but we know what to do with it. We know how to deal with a strike already. We know how to deal with that history of protest. And so I find provocative and interesting that that in these texts that I'm quoting from Puerto Rico, that they're putting pressure on um, on these other acts 
that frame or frame the problem of intelligibility itself. Mm -hmm. They don't give us answers to it, but they say actual protest has to be able to say, oh, this indexes a systemic um, issue. This indexes this 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 you know the way in which in social media or in the media people are responding to this woman's exit interview or what happened to this this person as a result of the tweet is actually revealing and disclosing something about the operations of the debt crisis and race, gender, um, and economic collapse. Um, so I'm interested in that. How do we how do we manage that? And so I think that these two questions really go together in the sense of the problem for me is the, the problem of intelligibility of these different acts that are not necessarily political in nature because they're not organized through through kind of standard ways are are actually indexing something that ought to be very political in nature or ought to allow us to organize. Um, whether they do or not, that is the, the precarious, fleeting, most of the times it doesn't. Um, but um, that's, that's the problem of the text. I'm not sure that it came through very well, but thank you for your questions. As for method, do you have something to say about method? For me. Oh, what, what? <laughs> so um, the question was about the, the, the term of critique, the philosophy, and how do we uh, separate them, or what we do we understand through them? How do we, uh, I don't know, invest the uh, practice of philosophy? That was your question. Okay. But I think it's. Uh, Not because I don't have the answer, but because the, the answer to that question is always changing. Mm -hmm. Because for I remember when I began philosophy and what I'm doing now, the way I represent the, 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 the conception of philosophy, it has nothing to do. And you can also have what I love with my discipline is that first, it is not knowledge. We are not positivist, positivist scientists bringing truth. Sorry, but we don't do that. And we have for us sometimes a possibility, and I will talk like Deleuze, but to, to feel the vertigo. The vertigo also of uh, reason, but also perhaps of uh, madness. So we are always in this kind of uh, balance that is quite difficult. And what I love with my discipline is that sometimes I hate it. And I have the opportunity to understand why I hate it. So I love to, person to personify philosophy, talk with, she's a woman, okay, to talk with her and just to say, I hate you today because you're too, I don't know, you're a tradition, I hate what you're doing, and sometimes to retake it. So I have this kind of relationship with my uh, discipline, and it's not, and it's always changing because, so perhaps I would have said critique, but I think that to, to, to define philosophy as a critic to me is too poor because it's not only that, it's about also creativity, and when you create something, you create a lot of uh, stupidity also. The history of philosophy is full of stupidities, and we are always trying to fight against it. So, I don't know. It's, um, I think that the privilege of the philosopher is to have this, this relationship with this discipline, to hate it, to love it, to create, to, to create it, and this is the relationship I have with it. That's why when I say anthropologist, that's provocative also, because I'm still doing things with my favorite Western racist philosophers and I still love them and I do work with them and write with them and when I say that I do anthropology it is um, it's just, can I just have the time for a little story, a very short one, a one minute story but I remember that I was completely schizo when I was a student because I was in the university, I had great masters, great professors but in the university, I had the impression that the only thing I could do was to be in the canon. And so, I felt like a stranger. And the real philosophy was not what I was doing in the university, but what I was doing in the activist world. I mean, it was very 
in the Afro-French activist world, where I learned <coughs> all those uh, philosophical things. So the way I entered in philosophy was completely conflictual at, since the beginning. And I still live into this conflict, and this is a kind of a intellectual journey, but I think it is desirable in itself. So, yeah, so I would just say that um, philosophy, I mean, I, there are two different, so philosophy is not a this is a very complicated, so I, I think philosophy always has to go beyond itself, and um, so yeah, it's a question of discipline, and I, so I spent a lot of time actually trying to, in, trying to interrupt the, the really, Yes, to try to think about what it means to 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 reproduce that discipline and to do it in, with intention, I would say. And so to de to to think about questions of those in canon, to think about you know what are philosophical traditions and you know all of these questions to, to interrupt the type of sexist and uh, racist kind of not just things that we find in the text that we love and hate, but also dynamics that are there in the very um, in the very field as it expresses itself in institution, institutional form. Um, so so yeah, but for me, yeah, I think that philosophy always has always has to go outside of itself. And so one one thing that has been extremely important for me starting to do philosophy in Puerto Rico and also writing about Puerto Rico now has been that philosophical practice or critique or even the creation of concepts happen in, in collective, embodied, artistic, <laughs> other forms that are not necessarily in the department of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that doing not just transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary work, but actually trying to think with a specific phenomenon, an object, and you know, really not just a text is essential for actually understanding a text. So, okay, well, out to the streets. <laughs> 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 